Hello and welcome to week four. Wow, can you believe it's week four already? Well, I tell you, this is actually one of the best weeks because we're going to be talking about domestic versus international operations. And I tell you, with my 30 years of international logistics management, things have become much more complicated, much more challenging, and it'd be great to have some discussions. Now this week, primarily what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about the advantages and disadvantages of international operations. You know, typical logistics challenges when dealing with countries' borders, added challenges when dealing with international supply chain, and the different functional areas within the logistics function. We're talking about, uh, you know, overshoot freight, warehousing, three uh, three party uh, providers. Okay. But let's just kind of go back and let's talk a little bit some of the main issues or things you had to contend with in international operations. One, labor cost. Okay. Then you're talking about international freight tariffs, taxation, currency exchange rates, customs. And, and remember, not only is it by, different by every country, and every border you go across, but they have different by commodities and the different levels of assembly. Right. You know, and the, and the general accounting rules, you know, they change over time. Right. Let, let's just take a look at uh, the labor cost in manufacturing. My field is in high technology data storage systems. And with with my time with Hitachi and also Western Digital and LSI Logic, you know, the labor cost really has a lot to do with your industry. For example, uh, in the United States, uh, in, our, in my field in data storage systems, 80% of the product cost is material, 20% labor. But if you look at the clothing industry, it's just the opposite. 80% of their product cost is labor, only 20% material. So when you're looking at different technologies, training, benefits, labor costs can really depend a lot. Now on the high end, now this is looking at labor costs in manufacturing. This is what they call what burdened labor cost, which has benefits, holiday schedules and everything going to it. Now, figuring that 100, uh, the U.S. is at $100 an hour, Switzerland is the highest with $155 an hour. Then comes Norway, Belgium, Denmark, and Germany. What all these have in common? One, they're high tech. Right? A lot of benefit packages, a lot of holidays. Right? But what about on, on, the other, on the other end? Right. Where in America using the $100 an hour comparison, Philippines, $5 an hour. Mexico, 10. And this is with benefits. So if you're a manufacturer of clothing, you can see why they look at different countries. Now, when you look in Europe, now, Europe has gone through the same type of issues where we had a factory in, in Ireland. And, and we're in the United States in 2008, a lot of activities went from the United States down to Mexico or overseas. In Ireland, it went to Eastern Europe, the same thing. And you're looking at Poland, you're looking at, at Turkey, you're looking at Hungary. You can look at the dollar per hour difference and you can understand why the manufacturing operations shift in those areas. Now, also when you're looking at like on the low end, you're looking at technology differences, you're looking at education levels, uh, you're looking at availability, a lot of different actions going through. Now, then you're looking at taxation on corporate income. That has a lot to do with uh, corporations deciding what country, what is going to be their home base because that drives your customs 
requirements. So look, just look at uh, taxes on, on the corporate level. You know, the different markups by countries, tax havens, some are not tax havens, and it depends whether you make or buy your products. Right. When I was with LSI Logic, I was on the ass assistant chair of the World Trade Council with Wichita State University. So I met with different trade and, uh, trade delegations and ambassadors each week. Each one would come in with a pitch of benefits saying, how about put a factory in our country and here's what we will do for taxation. Here's what we will do uh, for your company as a benefit. Okay. Now you have to look at some of the different requirements on uh, whether you're going to sell. For an example, in the United States, if you're going to sell a product to the U.S. government, they have a requirement that 50% of the content has to come from the United States. If you're going to sell your product in the European Union, in, in Europe, European Union has a requirement and has to be assembled in a European country. Right, so you have to look at all these and they do have a, a content and a preferential duty rates. So which, which countries have the highest income, uh, corporate income taxes? You have United Arab uh, Emirates at 55%. Now it's kind of a little misnomer. Now, the, in the, in the uh, Emirates, the only company that pays uh, income tax are the oil industry. Right? People don't pay income tax. Other companies don't pay corporate income tax. Oil, the oil industry it funds everything. Okay? But you, you can look at how, uh, you know, basically, there, there's, a, there's a trend line and activity. So you look at what's been going on in the latest in our political in Washington State, uh, the, the, the big seven companies are trying to set a world standard of 21%. You kind of see where some other countries who rely on corporate income taxes as, a, as an income base, you can see where they might have a little pushback going through. Now this is on the high end. So you have on the, on the low side, You have them very gone through. You have Barbados. Uh, well, it's amazing how a lot of companies, well, I won't say a lot. I will say some corporations now become, put their corporate headquarters in Barbados. Five and a half percent going through. Five and a half percent. So you can kind of see how a lot of these use them for enticements. Now, remember, Every different country has different custom requirements. Some of these just might be a tax shelter where, you, where uh, they might not have custom requirements or they might uh, say Bulgaria or Paraguay or some of these others, maybe they might. And so, but it's just something that adds to the complexity when it comes to uh, working on the international. Now on the US, on the in our domestic side, you know, granted, each state has a different income tax uh, ratios. Uh, some are higher, some are lower, which is a drive why uh, corporations move from one different location to another within the state. So there's some comparisons, but there's also some differences. So now this, this, this corporate tax rate, it's, it's a moving target. It's going through. Now this is just showing the differences from 2019 to 2020. You look at the differences in the, the changes in what they're charging for corporate income tax. So it looks like, now for example, Belgium, they were actively trying to get more and more co corporations to come and set up corporate operations in Belgium. So what they do, they lowered their uh, corporate income tax, almost 5%, which is a lot of money. Right? 
Now look at Greenland, you know, Greenland is trying to, now Greenland is a specialized country uh, in that they are very high tech and, and population wise, but well, as far as website designers, uh, IT professionals. Uh, so, you know, they're trying to entice more businesses, especially in uh, after, uh, you know, in the last couple of years with COVID and some of these, you can see where they're trying to entice and use the corporate tax change to kind of bring people in. Um, Magnesia, uh, you know, they're looking at, they're trying to increase the amount of money that comes in from corporate. So they're increasing their taxes for the companies that are there. They went up 9%. So you can look at a lot of influences I've gone through. So, but there are some, like I say, there are some countries that have zero income tax. Um, you know, Bahamas, you know, the, in, in 2020, they went to zero. Uh, uh, Bermuda, so you can see tax havens, you can see enticements, you can see how you as an international player have to understand how all this is a continuing change. Your corporate will have different requirements as far as customs activity or reporting structures or your, your cost of material. Right. So, but you understand it's a continued changing market, but I just want you to understand how complex it really is. And why, when you're watching the news, when you're looking at this item where they're talking about getting a worldwide standard of 21%, how does that impact us in the logistics profession and the supply chain side? If some of your vendors are in a country that increases their taxation base, you're going to have to contend with it. Remember, our primary goals in logistics and supply chain is to send, to take care of our customer, to satisfy their needs, the product they want, and to satisfy profitability for our corporations. Those are our primary goals. Now, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities that come with logistics supply chain as far as a lot different on the international stage than what you have in the United States. If you have a product or if you're going to put a shipment going from California to, to New York State, uh, the, you know, the, the export rate, you know, the regulations are very, very, very small. <coughs> but on the international side, there, there are some. There is what is called the denied parties list. And, and you have to get expert license. Now the denied parties list are embargoed or sanctioned countries. And there's a list of people and companies that are on this denied list. You're not allowed to sell product to because they've been known or caught and sending material to these countries that are on the list by the US government. Now, there are, uh, there's a, a CEO and the operations manager were arrested a couple of years ago. Why? Because they knowingly were trying to skirt the system and they were shipping to people, countries that were on the uh, denied parties list. And so this is a, it is your responsibility in the logistics area, shipping area, to know and understand you know, and to check this different parties. You can't just claim ignorance. It won't work. Now you have you know, different regulations on export licenses. All of this impacts your lead time from the time you make the order, the time it's received, the cycle time, the, you know, the lead time of your product. Right? Uh, transit time, export license approval cycle, custom clearance. Let me kind of give you an example from uh, pre 9-11 and after. Now, I would have a shipment of disk drives coming from Singapore. Uh, as as 18 hour flight goes from Singapore to Wichita, Kansas. And I would actually clear customs while it was still in the air. It was just a rubber stamp. It was a paperwork change. Then came 
Now, Adrian comes in. Now he has to sit into customs. They go through an evaluation. It may be in customs two weeks. So what used to be a, just a real, just a lead time of just a, a few hours, now you really have extended it. Now let, let's talk about uh, transit time. Now, if it's on a ship, you're looking at about two weeks transit, let's say from Singapore. And now you have a shortage of shipping containers that goes on these ships. Now these ships, you know, the super tankers, you know, they, they pretty well, they hold, you know, about two, 3,000 shipping containers on each ship. Do you realize that almost two to 3,000 of these shipping containers fall off the ships into the ocean each year? Yeah. Now, some of them sink to the very bottom, you know, by storms, you know, these type of things. And they, they sink to the bottom because of the heavy weight of the material, or they may float. And who knows, it ends up on an island. And now you have an island that have people who are sitting there with uh, treadmills that they use for hanging uh, food on. Right? It's just, it's another thing. This is where the insurance industry becomes so important in the international area. It can be very expensive. And going through uh, customs, wow, that, that really depends by countries. I would send, uh, you know, some areas you go through customs, it's a breeze. But if I send material, say, to Japan, and let's say the invoice we had listed 100 widgets, if the the material department had 99 widgets in there or 101 by mistake. All right, the cut Japanese custom was send the whole order back to Wichita, Kansas. Right. And so, so it's just each country is different. The customs clearance documentation is much more complicated now than what it ever has been. So what, what embargoed countries are, are we talking about? Now, this is uh, from uh, the government's uh, website this week. And so you had Cuba, Iran, Syria, right? They're prohibited. Uh, Iran, North Korea, uh, Venezuela. And so what would happen is you would have someone in, in a company buy computer parts or, or in my field, data storage systems. And they would send them to a customer in Venezuela, you know, as, as farm equipment, right? Because, you know, we, they don't want electronics going down there for, you know, can, it, can they be adapted over to military or government usage, those type of things, right? And there's different targeted sanction countries uh, you know, different special policies, whether you're talking about Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Vietnam. And so you have to, you're going to become knowledgeable on the embargoed sanctioned countries and what are the limitations. It sounds complicated, right? No, it's not, it's not that it's complicated, but it's time consuming. It's a different way, different from, say, doing business in the United States between states, and if you're trying to do business outside the United States. That's why it's a specialization. If you're not working on the international side in supply chain right now at some level, you will be within, say, the next five years. It's a universal platform. Right. Now, what about what's the uh, denied uh, person's list. Well, here, here is an example. Pulled in front of the website, you have companies, you have uh, people, you have people that have been arrested and they're in jail by order of uh, incarceration, or they have a warrant out for their arrest. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, you, if you go down to Abdullah Nasser, is prohibited from 2002 all the way through 2056. Right. And so you, you, you have to build to know where do you find the database? 
where do you go check? Right? Or do you have someone do it for you? Right? And so when you're looking and say, why this is complicated, well, you're right, it is. Now, let, let's talk about if you're shipping material from California to New York, you may have bill laden uh, weight scales, you know, because you're not may pay highway taxes in different states for your trucks. And so I, items here, bill of material, shipping invoice, going through. Let's take a look at the extensive documentation for export. <coughs> wow. All right. So we look at all the different documents required the export customs clearance. Quality check, uh, packing list, uh, invoices. Right? Then you have another one, uh, bill of materials, export licenses, country of origin documentation, bill of lading, bill of site, payment requirements, the bill of exchange, letter of credits, health certificates, uh, warehousing receipts. It, you can see how, how big and how complicated export is. But yet in, in the United States, in our field of logistics and supply chain, our biggest growth has been in exports. And so you, it really helps you understand where the difference is between the two. Again, there, there's a lot of, lot of information, uh, a lot of details in the reporting structure, but you know, there's actually free training online that's available. And so if you go to this link down there, they have an online training room. And so they have little video training programs set up and they're free. And so as you, whether you're talking about license applications, uh, whether you're talking about uh, classification requests, they, they have a whole series of training extra, uh, training programs which will help you learn how to do it. And with the constant changes in rules and regulations, you might want to keep going back and checking this website for any updates of going through. So you can look at now, it's pretty, pretty extensive. Uh, training's available, but you can also see where it can become a specialization. Now, you know, there, there's different types of international uh, sourcing strategy. You have what, what they call uh, intro for, now at LSI, you know, we had a factory in Wichita, Kansas, and we had a factory in, in Cork, Ireland. Because remember, to sell in the European Union, it had to be assembled in uh, an EU country. Now, there'd be times where I would, uh, we'd work in, uh, between together, uh, let's say the United States, let's say I, I had an upside in orders and I couldn't meet it, I'd go to my counterpart in, in Cork, Ireland and may buy some uh, material from him. Okay. Or let's say that, let's say well, I'm gonna get a price break on a thousand widgets. I said, well, I only need 500, but I can send 500 to Cork, Ireland. Now our, in our, our supply chain manager was in Ireland. And so you can see where a company carries a lot of major components in house and buys them uh, you know, uh, domestically. Right. Then you have on the international side, they're gonna offshore subsi uh, uh, subsidy sourcing. Uh, let's say uh, let's say at LSI Logic, let's say we buy material from our Cork Ireland facility is a different company. And so we, we go through. In Hitachi, they would buy components from the parent company factories in Japan. And so I'd get, say, a month uh, uh, material uh, for manufacturing invoiced. I'd have to pay a price. Uh, I have to worry about uh, currency changes, fluctuations, you know, customs, duties, tariffs, 
but there it was from within my own company. Then you have outsourcing. There's a different way of outsourcing domestically. Outsourcing domestically is uh, where you're buying material from uh, your, your independent suppliers. Okay. Now, let's, let's say that, you know, it could be, it could be parts, could be material, it could be services. Sometimes people think of outsourcing automatically as being outside the country building a product. Well, outsourcing can be a lot of different things. For example, when you go to uh, a factory or even the mall and they have security. Now, the security agents aren't employees of the mall or the factory. They're, they, they work for a security company. They have a specialization. So you're outsourcing your security to that company. What about print shops? Uh, and uh, we used to have our own print shop at LSI. And then we outsourced it to a print shop across town where we didn't want to invest in leasing new print equipment at that time. So we were able to outsource that operation of, you know, to a print shop. And they just deliver what we're needing. And so you're looking at what about the international? There is a company buys major components from independent suppliers internationally. In, in my field, uh, specifically in South Korea on data store on integrated circuits. <coughs> Excuse me. And what are you having right now? You have a worldwide shortage. Why did we have a worldwide shortage impacting international? COVID-19. While COVID-19 was in effect, uh, specifically through uh, 2020, for example, car sales went down to zip. You know, the uh, demand for people shifted more to like smart TVs, streaming, because they were trying to stay at home, they wanted the streaming services. Uh, you have uh, a lot more of the games, the electronic games that were being in high demand. So all of the, the shifting, the manufacturing that shifted to the integrated circuits that were being used as those products. So now 2021, what you have, you have a shortage. Now the integrated circuit companies in South Korea and, and uh, you have Taiwan. Taiwan produces 70% of the world's integrated circuits. Now they're having to shift, no? So what do you say, okay, they're having to shift back. What's the impact? Most American cars have between 20 and 50 electronic components, integrated circuits, microprocessors, in every car. What are, are there some of the other products that have gone electronic? Refrigerators, freezers, washers, dryers. Right? And so now there's a shortage on those as well. So you can see how it's, it's, a, it's a game that moves back and forth. And there's, there's a lot of different influences. Now, the, the good example to look at would be the auto, automotive industry on how complex uh, it is and the different, and you look, you look on the domestic and you look at the international. And because there are some, some very substantial differences on how uh, the, the system works. Now look at uh, the, the man, uh, manufacturing establishments companies in the United States uh, for the automotive industry. <laughs> you see areas by concentrations uh, along the border regions. Well, you know you have a lot, a lot of in the uh, automotive areas up in the Midwest. Right. And so you can really see just by the numbers, how, how vast it could be. So in the United States, think about, you have this additional supply chain. Remember, over 80% of all of products in the United States are shipped by truck, over 90%. So you can see how distance can be related in the planning structure on the domestic side. Now remember that 
uh, you know, 5% of the international, of the uh, sh shipping products in the United States goes by rail. And then the rest of it is split between the river systems, say uh, the Mississippi or the Ohio River, ocean carrying, and air freight. Air is only about 1%, but it's expensive. Now think about what happened with, with COVID-19 on why and how it could impact the international. For an example, in 2020, 2020, 2020 the airport, the airlines flights decreased by 90%, decreased. All right. So you can see how all of a sudden that whole industry was impacted by COVID-19. Now, look at the impact on that's on domestic. Now, let's look what happens in the international. International essentially shut down the whole industry. Now, so you have all these, because now we're not sending anybody in business, which are the business customers are the, are the main customer base in the international for the airlines. But what's on those, you know, you, know, you have your business people up on the top of the seats. What do you have under the plane? inside the base, in the cargo area, you have material that's being shipped, right? Now, all of a sudden, all that is going by, and now all of a sudden you have nothing that are available to ship products by air impact. So what do they do? They shift, they have to go by ocean. Then you have issues of, uh, you know, now you have a shortage of the shipping containers. There are three manufacturers that build the, the shipping containers in the world. And the three manufacturers are all in China. And so you're going through, and they've had to shut down some of their facilities. Remember, uh, due to the COVID-19, reduce staff, same type of thing. Now, remember when I talked about how many get lost in the ocean every year? Now you have, right now, whole ships, now we're talking about major super tanker ships, not tankers, but super cargo ships that are loaded with empty containers being shipped back to China <laughs> because they're needing to ship product back to us. Now, of course, that impacts you on the international side of trying to have these containers so you can send your product overseas or to Europe. And we'll talk about some differences of how this impacted your cost. Now let's look at auto parts and exports by, by region. For example, you know, we're in North America, you're talking about almost $52 billion, billion dollars. Right. You know, Russia uh, and Asia, uh, you're looking at uh, 25 billion. All right, so you can see the difference is Europe, 13 billion, all right, South America. So you can really see how valuable it is. But look at the increase in exports to Asia, all right, 506%. All right. And this was pre COVID 19, it has even got up more since then. So you can see how by regions, where we talk about the challenges by regions, every country is different, every has customs, everyone has different documentation requirements. And so you can see how complicated the international side can really be. Uh, but let's take a look at Ford and on how in the European Union, you know, they 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 don't have the distance that we showed in the United States. So in Belfast, they you know they're building the carburetors and distributors. Right? Uh, and uh, in Spain, there's your final assembly. Uh, in, in Germany, maybe the transmission parts or the engine. And so you can really see how there you know, they, they have a highway system they're using primarily and barges, but their distance isn't anything like 
what we are accustomed to in the United States as far as mileage. Okay. So remember, look how scattered and wide ranging this flyers were in the United States. Now there, there's a difference in methodologies on supply side. Now, for an example, in, in the European, you look in here and forward in the Europe, you know, they have pretty much, they're using all the specialties within the different areas. Uh, Germany is very high tech. Right? And so you're looking at areas, they're looking at uh, uh, Ireland, Great Britain, uh, you know, different technologies, different areas. Now, when you look at Japan, now Japan has the 100 mile rule in their supply chain for the automotive industry. And what that is, is that their suppliers have to be within 100 miles of the factory. Why? Because they have quick daily deliveries of parts, just in time delivery. Now, believe me, because I've been in Japan many, many, many times, and, and uh, their the highway systems, or the most of us being driven and driven by the back of little trucks or cars, and, and their logistics program, they have a lot of challenges in, in Japan. But the advantage is they have everything within 100 miles. Well, it's an island. It's easier to do. Now, when they set up operations in the United States, they kept that methodology. So if let's say you have a manufacturing facility in Indiana, well, they would want all their suppliers still to be within 100 miles. So you have the subsidiary setting up operations to support that factory within 100 mile radius. <laughs> now, automotive uh, relationships, it's not as clear what used to be domestic, what was international. Now, I had a Dodge Colt Vista, a little hatchback, and also had their, uh, their SUV, right? Now they were Dodge. No, they're really Mitsubishi, right? Now I own a, a 2020 uh, Subaru SUV. Well, I had a, a guy I served with in the Marines and he, he said, why don't you buy American? I did. This car was assembled in Indiana. And so this cross the border relationship in automotive industry is not as clear cut as what used to be international or was in domestic or what flavor. For example, look at some of the different relationships uh, I've gone through. Remember, remember, I tell you about Dodge, you had Mitsubishi, you see here, Suzuki, uh, you have uh, Fiat, uh, Izu, uh, you know, Daewoo. So you can see how all these different either part ownerships or, uh, or they're owned by the companies. You can really see how it can be very complicated. Now, remember, included in this complication, remember all that documentation we looked at as far as exports? It's the same way you try to bring material in. And so it's a very complicated uh, working with the government side when you're going across borders. Right? Now, you see, looking on the lower right hand corner, you can see where it says, all right, there's Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep. All right? You see, if they ship from Mitsubishi. Yeah, that was my car. Right. You know, Mitsubishi has a relationship with Hyundai in Korea. And so, you know, these are part ownerships. And so you have all these different relationships that are going on. Now, that has a really big increase in growth of U.S. exports. Uh, we are the business per percentage of our activity on the international side has really been growing. And so that's why I'm saying if you're not working with some level of international supply chain now, you will be. Let me give you an example. Look at the percentage uh, of, of growth. Okay. And so, and this, and this is uh, looking at fund. Now, this is going back to the 70s. 
look at the growth of exports been more than more than twice uh, of uh, these uh, the uh, financial growth the financial growth in the united states has been steady but look at the export systems right. look how challenging look at the growth of it now there are some upsides you know this this shows the complexities but there's upsides to globalization now the United States is the undistributed leader in global healthcare innovation. Right? And it's really been blowing over the last 10 years. Six of the largest 10 pharmaceutical companies are based in the United States. Right? And that also goes with uh, medical devices. Right? And, and back on 2014, the United States alone controlled 45% of the global market share of global healthcare innovation equipment. Right. Eight of 10 medical device manufacturers are domestic. Right. And so when you look at the technology industry, the United States is leading the globe. 30% of the global IT spending comes from technology products made in the United States. So you have all of these things saying, to our advantage of globalization, we have a growth in the international side. Right? And so now you're gonna say, well, what are some of the driving forces that, that impact these things? Now you have uh, global market forces, technology, global cost forces, and political and economic forces. So think about what, what type of things you see in the news right now daily, how they impact these pictures. Now, I'm just going to hit the real high side just to kind of give you some ideas on, on how to consider it. On the global uh, market forces, um, you know, foreign competition in the local markets, you have the growth in the foreign demand, which we showed in the, in the growth. Uh, sales going to European is, is, is great. Well, you know, look at the uh, pharmaceutical, look at uh, grain, for example, uh, going to China is a big customer for our, our grain industry. Uh, you know, steel, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things going on around the world. And so, you know, different companies are using globalization to put especially, uh, companies, you know, their networks around the world to get them some defensive. Uh, so if, if economy goes bad in one part of the country, it won't impact the rest of them. Uh, Nestle's and Kellogg's is a good example. Uh, let's go for example of their products being changed by the domestic market, their domestic market. If you buy a Coke in Brazil, it won't taste like the Coke that you buy in, uh, in the United States because it is blended for their, uh, their appetites, their, their flavors. Uh, if you go to, uh, even, even go say, go to Japan, uh, you know, their food is, you can get the same, you go to McDonald's, uh, they have McDonald's in Japan uh, and they have their food is different because it has different taste buds going through. Uh, uh, you know, when I went to Japan, you know, I had my first rice burger. Uh, it took me a little while to get used to it, but I did. Uh, so you look at the difference uh, of going through. And then you had the presence of the state of the art markets. You know, Japan is really huge on consumer electronics, Germany, machine tools. All right. In the US, our specialization is SUVs. Okay. And so then you're looking at what are some of the other markets that are forcing, how about changes in demand? Some of the countries that are growing much faster growth-wise, income-wise uh, is India. Uh, and you're looking at China, 
And so you have all these uh, companies that are drawing upon these, these specializations as demand there. So, you know, right now I, I'm trying to remember the, the numbers, but uh, technology of 5G to say, you know, the influences of technology in Japan when it comes to smartphones. Because let's, let's say that um, Sanyo uh, comes out with a smartphone. They will sell it on the Japanese market first before it's exported to the other parts of the world. Hitachi did the same thing. So that, that is normal. Now, look, it is really, and we have something to contend with COVID-19 that's really, has really taken the supply and, and global uh, operations, logistics to task. And so how can, how companies, how can they respond to changes due to COVID-19? Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with business relationships. Mary, I told you about China is a growth country. India is a growth country. Uh, and so you have all these, how do you educate the employees about the COVID-19 symptoms and prevention? Right now, a lot of people have been working remotely. Right? Now companies are wanting to bring, start bringing them back. And then there's going to be some resistance. You know, it's a ch new change. Now people are saying, oh, I kind of like working from home. I kind of like not having to fight traffic or to ride a bus or, or a trail. Right. How are you going to reinforce screening protocols? Now this has to do with, with doing the international scene. Right now, uh, in the, the, uh, the Olympics in Japan, right? They're not allowed to have any visitors attend the Olympics from out of the country. And in Tokyo, just yesterday, they're saying no one can be a spectator, even Japanese locals. And they got their attendance by lottery to get a draw. So it was a real special big deal. So how are they going to reinforce screening? How are you going to uh, work with uh, Companies, you're sending people all over, say, to Asia or your quality group to go visit factories, your auditing processes, or your middleman in your logistics. How are you going to screen them when they come back? All these different protocols are going to be uh, considered. You have to prepare for increased absenteeism. Right? The restriction of travel. Right now, the airlines are starting to open up again. But you know, a lot of the shipping industry uh, is still uh, is, is struggling to kind of get it going. You're having to change your methodology for promote flexible working arrangements from whether home or shops or having a blended say, well, you get that level of communication you need. You know, you, have you ever had it where you're uh, zoomed out of, you know, you're just worn out from having uh, Zoom calls. Well, people miss that socialization of being in an office. They also miss being able to get away from the hassles and the stresses of home. So now, so no, so they're offering more flexible versions saying, come in to work two days a week in the office and work the other days from, from home. This, this flexible working is going through. Align your IT systems and support and working requirements. What has been going on lately is ransom attacks. You know, it was just uh, over uh, the 4th of July weekend, right? a thousand companies were hit by ransom attacks. And so, and the company, the, the group that is doing these, this, the one of the players uh, doing it, is said, well, yeah, pay $70 million and we'll release them. No, not you know. How, think about if if your company uh, got hit with a ransomware, or your city, uh, or your shipping company, and so your IT group has to be very diligent. People working from home have to have special security systems to protect their computer, which can get into your company network. 
Sorry. How about succession planning for your executives? Every every executive, we know that we should have exec, uh, succession planning. We should be training our replacements anyway. Right. But just over the last month, 5 million people have quit their jobs. Right. They're saying, well, this COVID-19 has made me think about what I want to do for a living or uh, you know, what I want to do with my life. And so you really need to have succession plan, not just for key executive positions, but all positions. You should be training your replacement anyway. And, and you saw the complexity in the international logistics and supply chain. You can see how it can do a lot. And so you look at your compensation program, maybe just skill base, like what I did at, at uh, Tachi, I put in a skill based program where the more they learn, the higher pay they get. It gives a benefit to you as a company, it gives a benefit to them. Okay. Then you have cash flow, a lot more concentration, input, output, uh, government spending, uh, government enticements, uh, government loan programs. A lot more on the cash flow. Now you're having to also think about the availability of not being able to get enough people to fill your positions. All right. So you have a lot of these different issues to contend with. There's, like I said, that it impacts your domestic and it impacts your international. Right. What is one of the other shortages right now? Truck drivers. I think about that, and the value of truck drivers is people really saw with COVID-19 how important our trucking industry, our drivers, and our supply chain really were. And so we're always like the, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. You know, people just see the wizard. They see the product on the shelves. They see the food, uh, you know, in the store. And we're, be, we're like the wizard behind the curtain. We're doing all the work. They don't see what we're doing to make it all happen. But well, COVID-19 kind of opened that curtain where people kind of got an idea of how complicated our field really is. Right. And so right now there's a there's a truck driver shortage of over in the United States, over 200,000 drivers are short. Right. And so so now in this just for it was for you know in, in this class, I told you, you know, in the beginning of course, that you can anticipate fuel shortages. Gas, gas shortages. It wasn't because of the availability of gas. They don't have enough drivers to deliver them. And it was just on the news yesterday. That is a big issue in some areas. They can't get drivers to deliver. They don't have enough drivers to deliver. Different states are changing their, uh, their driver requirements, professional driver, commercial driver's requirements. Based on the national is 21. Colorado lowered it to 18 which means an 18 year old can be driving a semi, a school bus within the state of Colorado. They can go out of state because the national is still 21, but it kind of gives you an idea of how going through. Look how you've seen on TV, radio, advertising for drivers, there's a big shortage. We're not the only ones. Canada has gone through the same thing and so is Europe. Remember, 80, over 80% 80 of all products in the United States are delivered by trucks. And so you have a lot more, uh, and I think I have some examples in here on how companies are trying to uh, be innovative and kind of looking through. <laughs> you know, last week we showed you, I showed you some examples on uh, the trucking industry where um, with Tesla and, the, and electron, uh, electric semis, you have Walmart uh, de designing uh, electric truck uh, semis and with one driver versus a two. You have company, truck companies that are designing semis with zero drivers. You know, we, we, we talked about the remote activity. So there's a, so many, a lot of things that can go on. But what are some of the other disruptions from COVID-19? You know, for companies that you know, we have to really change our emphasis on our workforce planning, focus on our tier one supplier risk, whether it's domestic or international. 
we have to really look at our extended supply chain network, the number of countries and borders. We have to understand how it have alternate risk of suppliers. You need a much better inventory policy and planning. Now I had inventory locations around the world and believe me, it is very challenging, uh, as challenging to have inventory locations in Singapore, Philippines, uh, and the United States or Europe. You still have to have a way for accuracy of inventory. And if, if your system says you have 10 widgets, do you really have 10? You have to have better uh, ability to tr track your material online. In the United States, it's pretty much easier because a lot of your trucks right now have GPS on the trucks. So I could actually get it from my supply, my vendor saying, all right, here's the truck location. I used to be able to track it on, on a map on the website. I can see where my truck, my deliveries are. And so now, you know, when you have a lot of ships going there, the ships are a lot easier to track. There's actually websites you go to and you can actually see, uh, track the deliveries. Okay. At any one time, there's normally over 2,000 uh, super tankers in the water going through the world. So there, there's a lot of activity, a lot of movement. Okay. Looking for plant closures, plan form, expect them. Okay. It's not that you're not going to have customers. You may not have material. You may have spot shortages, like we're doing with integrated circuits. You may have labor shortages, like what you're going through, trying to get, you know, companies have been operating, say, at 50%. Now they're trying to get new people to come back in to fill the ranks, and there's some challenges. Right. Look at alternative uh, logistics options, uh, going, uh, looking at going out. You know, we, we talked about uh, how Amazon Air as you know, they're looking at, they've signed contracts to develop their drone delivery. Uh, so within certain locations. So if I order a book from Amazon, they, they have delivered, you know, I'm up in Northwestern, uh, Northeastern uh, Washington state by the Canadian border. They can, the drone can drop it off into my driveway. They're looking at alternatives. Right. And you have to look at your global scenario planning. You have to do your what ifs. What if you have floods in Thailand? Thailand is a major supplier for power supplies. What about Singapore? What if you have a hurricane or a typhoon in, in Singapore? Well, they're the one of the world suppliers of disk drives. And so you need to kind of look at all these different scenarios and the what ifs. That's our job. And I'm going to run out of time. I, there, there's, just, there's just so much going on. Uh, you prepare different uh, channels distribution, uh, prayer for a rebound, uh, looking for uh, your, your strategy on trying to tie in your supply chain and, and your demand. <laughs> now, just look at just, I'm just going to hit the technology on a real high side because I have about one minute. Uh, many of the high-tech components are developed overseas. We need a relationship with our international suppliers. Uh, you have uh, different you know, production and uh, engineering development. In LSI, we have manufacturing facilities in Wichita, Kansas, Cork, Ireland. We had engineers in, in Wichita that when they got off at five o'clock, all their work was in a major database and we had an identical engineering unit in India where they were just coming to work. So then they would continue on. So they used the, the value of time, the different time zones to actually reduce the new product introduction time by 50%. So you're kind of going through. Again, looking at your labor costs, your priorities, your infrastructure, your amount of skilled labor, labor that is available. We talk about the tax breaks, joint ventures, price breaks, and your costing. Again, looking at your exchange rates, 
looking at different trade agreements, which is a continually changing platform. You know, we had the traditional Pacific Rim, which in the previous administration was canceled. Now it's back again. Uh, you had NAFTA, which was essentially rewritten. All these variations you need to stay on top of. All right. Of course, then you get into your political uh, and you see where all the different requirements and uh, every new administration is more challenging. And it kind of gets in where it just adds more of your difficulties, where you're talking about skilled labor, performance of expectations, your supplier availability, right, and transportation. Well, I really appreciate this. I, you can kind of tell I get excited talking about this international. It is so challenging, so much fun. Just plan on a great career with it. And whether you're, you're going to use it as a career or whether you're just going to need to understand how it works and how challenging it can be. Well, I wish you all the very best. And, uh, and see you next week.